Hello, my name is Stephen Ward and today I'm going to be going over an overview of our A&M system. So today I'm going to talk about the reasons why we need A&M systems. From a planning perspective, I'm going to show how a system can be constrained under worst case analysis. Then we're going to illustrate this with a schematic and show a theoretical situation. We're then going to have a look at an example where we'll show a real world situation highlighting our Orkney A&M system. I will then show how our measurement points are configured. Finally, we're going to have a look at the system architecture and show the journey that the measurement point data takes from the field to controlling the site. So why do we need A&M systems? Currently, our networks are studied at two worst case scenarios. In the summer, the networks are investigated with maximum generation and minimum demand. And in the winter, the networks are studied with minimum generation and maximum demand. This study method effectively caps the maximum amount of capacity we can connect. However, it does leave opportunity for variable output systems that effectively fill the gaps in between. By deploying real-time A&M systems, we can make the most of this dynamic headroom available on the network and connect additional resource that may otherwise have required reinforcements. An A&M system allows us to issue real-time maximum capacities or set points to the generators and importantly, still provides us the ultimate protection against worst case criteria. This schematic diagram shows a relatively simple example where we have two 90 MVA transformers feeding a wider network. Worst case studies dictate that we can't go over 90 MVA firm capacity, as if we lost one transformer, the other one's gonna be overloaded. Another 90 MVA of capacity could be connected under a non-firm arrangement using an inter-trip scheme as this is going to disconnect this 90 MVA in the event of a fault. In reality, though, these connections are not always going to be running at 90 MVA. An additional actively network management generation can be dynamically controlled to maximize the available capacity. If we monitor the real time current flow through the highlighted points, we can assign a set point value to fill the gaps between the existing connections. Without the use of a and we'd be unable to connect this capacity as we had no protection under the worst case scenarios. So moving forward, let's have a look at a real world example. Here we have a relatively basic overview of our Orkney system. The Orkney system is made up of multiple constraints and multiple measurement points spread across the islands. There are constraints between the islands. However, ultimately, the whole system is limited by the subsea cables that feed back to the mainland. They're shown here as one and two on this diagram. The Orkney system has allowed over 20 additional generators connect to the grid that otherwise would have had to wait on major reinforcements due to the worst case studies. All these generators join what we call a LIFO stack, which is essentially the order that the generators were connected to the system, with the last generator in being the first to be curtailed or tripped, depending on the measurement point values. Just to add a little bit of real context, I wanted to show uh, the real building that contains the measurement points that govern the power back to the mainland. Inside this building are the 33 kV breakers that house the cables that feed to the mainland. These cables run outside and go up to the overhead line shown and then uh, head towards the shore and down into the sea. As a planner, we typically see this summarized into a single line diagram as shown adjacent. So that diagram on the right over there is the, the building, the bit saying Scorradale is the building that's on the left. So these measurement points, how do they work and what fail safes do we have built in? When designing an a &M, we need to ensure we do not exceed the asset rating or come anywhere close to tripping breakers. So knowing that the thermal rating of the asset is the ultimate limit, how do we set the thresholds of when to curtail and when to trip? Our main fail safe is called the global trip, and it's the value where all a &M generation will be tripped off. This value is set slightly below the asset rating to avoid any overloads. We have another trip function set below the global trip called the consecutive trip. Now this is designed in a way to avoid a global trip of the whole system and will trip the sites lowest in the stack or most relevant to the constraint in an effort to prevent that global trip. Of course, we don't want the, to trip generators, and that's why we have a trim margin set below the aforementioned trip values. In the, if the measurement point goes above the trim threshold, curtailment is going to be sent to the generators in order of the LIFO stack. Generators will then scale back and in theory, avoid any of the wider trips. 
measurement points will release capacity once the recorded values go below the reset value. Now I'm going to talk about how we get this information from the measurement points to the generators. The measurement points are of course fitted with communications equipment, where this data from the measurement points is forwarded to our cloud-based centralised A&M system. The centralised A&M system interfaces with, with our control room in real time via SCADA and also communicates to the local controllers that are based on site. These local controllers on each individual site interpret the data from the centralised system and then provide a 4 to 20 milliamp set point signal, which is then sent to your individual site. The customer generation should then be capable of scaling according to this milliamp signal, uh, which they receive from us. I'm Jenny Lindsay, and I'm the Flexible Solutions Support Technician. My role is to check the ANM system for any faults and to ensure that the correct people are involved to fix any issues as quickly as possible. I've been in this role for just over a year now, and would just like to go over the main responsibilities for the support technician and a fault scenario. Twice daily checks are completed on all ANM schemes. We are looking for alarms, curtailment, or any generators being out of service. We have a live system which gives us an overview of the ANM, but I can also check our network around all generators. It may be that there is a fault or planned works, and I can see up to date information on here. I also have access to information from outage planning, so I can see if there's any planned works that day. We have a dedicated email address for the ANM, which is anm.operations at sse.com. This is a group inbox, so the whole team has access to it. Any queries to this email will be dealt with as quickly as possible, and this is the best way to get in touch with us regarding the ANM. Should we find an issue do, during our daily checks, or be informed by a customer, or sometimes the control room, we have a process to follow. This will include checking on our live system to see if there's anything obvious. We also have other teams who we can involve. We also have various applications which can give us current and historical data. This helps with the investigation. During works and maintenance, I will make sure that customers are aware of the upcoming works, providing as much notice as possible. I will assist the teams involved in the works to make sure that the generators are put out of service and restored into service in a controlled manner to protect the network and the generators. It is very important that we have up-to-date contact information. Please let us know if ownership changes or if your contact details need to be amended. I would just like to go through a potential fault scenario with you. During my checks, I'll look at our live system. If I can see an alarm which shows that there is a comms fault, for example, I'll then check the network around the generator to see if there is an outage. If there is an outage, I'll check with the control room to see if this is affecting the generator. I'll also look to see if this has been a planned outage or whether it is a fault. If it is a fault, we will let the customers know, but if it's a planned outage, the customer should already be aware. If the network is intact, I'll run through some data to analyse when the issue occurred, and then I'll go through our dedicated process, which involves speaking to internal teams, such as IT or real-time systems, and our external vendors, such as our support engineers. They will be asked to investigate, and they will also use live and historical data. They will keep in contact with myself and the support team with updates and possibly ask us for further information. They may ask that we send someone to site to investigate or fix the issue. In this case, we use our SSE network engineers near site. Sometimes we might email the customer to see if there are any works on site or if they are aware of an issue which may cause a fault. Once a fault has been resolved, we will make sure to keep a record of the incident and the resolution. We will also then make all relevant parties aware and contact the customer. The following section of this presentation will look at access and forward-looking charges, significant code review, the impact this may have on flexible connections and what it means to you, the customer. We will then cover off curtailment assessments and follow up with a brief summary. What is Access SCR? On the 3rd of May 2022, Ofgem published its final decision, the Access SCR decision, and direction, the Access SCR direction, to implement the Access Significant Code Review. These documents with full details can be found at the links within the orange box below. In terms of when it's going to be implemented, SCN has to implement these reforms by the 1st of April 2022.
2023. Key reforms are the shallowing, shallower charging boundaries and the ability to offer customers a curtailable connection with a limit and a set end date. These are the key things that we will focus on, on within this session today. Let's look at these elements in a bit more detail. First of all, let's look at the shallower boundary. For a final demand site, i.e. a demand connection, will have a shallow boundary. This means the DNO fully funds reinforcements and recovers the costs through DUOS unless high cost cap is exceeded. For a non-final demand site, i.e. generation connection, will have a shallower boundary. This means the customer only contributes to reinforcement at the same voltage level as their point of connection, again, unless a high cost cap is exceeded. Where there is reinforcement identified, the customer can request a curtailable connection. So a curtailable access arrangements will be available to users where there's a requirement for reinforcement and a specific network need for curtailment to manage local network constraints. So in example, if you are a generation connection and you have triggered reinforcement at the voltage level above, SSEN can offer a curtailable connection to allow you to get connected ahead of the reinforcement being completed and will provide you with that within an offer. SSEN will also provide a curtailment limit. So curtailment limits connections will be set by the DNO in accordance with an industry agreed process and included in the offer to the connecting customer. If the DNO needs to curtail above this limit, then they must procure the service from the market. The curtailable connection offer will have an explicit end date after which the connection must be made firm. By firm, we mean transferred over to a non curtailable connection. Additional points to make clear. So there will be a clear go live date to be implemented. So this is April 2023. In flight jobs will remain under ED1 rules. There will be no rebates for customers that have previously paid including in-flight jobs for reinforcement. Current non-firm a and customers can apply for a firm connection but may incur costs. No moratorium period expected. No changes to the current treatment of transmission work triggered by a distribution connection at this time. Touching on the last point, what we mean by this is that if there is a transmission constraint um, and say that it's going to be five, six years before that constraint is lifted, you can still request a flexible connection. However, there will be no guaranteed curtailment limit and or end date because it's subject to a transmission constraint. Let's move on to curtailment assessments. It is an important point to call out to begin with that curtailment assessments are different to curtailment limits. Curtailment limits under Access SCR is based on the number of hours of access to the network, whereas curtailment assessments provides an indication of the megawatt hours that you will be curtailed by or will be available. Okay. Curtailment assessments is a chargeable fee by SSEN to the customers, and there'll be more details on this closer to the target go live date, which is March 2023. The way we conduct curtailment assessments is by doing some analysis which is based on SSEN network models and we use time series simulations based on certain assumptions. These assumptions will be listed within the curtailment report which will be received um, through, once the process is concluded and will be sent out to the customer in the form of a feasibility study. The simulations are performed on a half hourly basis throughout a simulated period of two years using historical data. For already connected generators, their historical generation will be used where possible. In cases of inadequate, missing or corrupted data, generation profiles will be used instead. For the customer that is applying, if they have a bespoke or known profile, then that can be provided to SSEN to use within the assessment. 
otherwise a generic profile for that technology type will be used.